Hello, my name is Melissa Conley Tyler. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne, and I acknowledge that we're broadcasting today from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present and welcome any Indigenous guests who are joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us for this fascinating discussion of Asian Australians in politics, overcoming the barriers. Today, we're going to be featuring research which has been produced by one of the Asia Institute's researchers, uh, Dr. Sajit Dunji, and was published recently in the uh, Institute's Melbourne Asia Review. We're then going to hear a panel of reactions um, from Asian Australians who have successfully uh, forged careers in politics. So at the federal level, we very much welcome Gladys Liu. Thank you for joining us. From state level, we thank Koshalia Vagela. And from local government level, we have the former mayor of the city of Yarra, Daniel Longwen. Um, finally, we'll end up with questions and discussions. So we have question and answer open the whole time. And if you do have any questions or reactions at any point when we're discussing, just please put them there. So to kick us off, I'm going to welcome the Deputy Director of the Asia Institute, Andrew Rosser, who's also uh, in charge of the Governance Cluster, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne and the work of the Governance Cluster. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Melissa. Look, I thought uh, it would be helpful for me to make a few preliminary comments to provide some background to today's discussion and in particular explain how it fits into the research program of the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. The Asia Institute is the University of Melbourne's key centre for studies in Asian languages, cultures and societies. Over the last few years, it's become home to two separate streams of work that relate to the topic of today's webinar. The first is that associated with the Institute's research cluster on Asian governance transformations. This research cluster focuses on understanding the nature of governance within the Asian region on the subnational, national and regional levels. It carries out analysis that is comparative in nature and centres on institutions, networks and processes that connect countries and subregions. In this context, it's concerned not just with matters of governance within Asia itself, but also matters of governance related to Australia's various connections to the region, including via its Asian Australian communities. The second stream of work is a research project on Asian Australians and public policy that's been generously supported since its inception by Mr. Jason Yeap OAM. This project's goal is to explore Australia's growing and diversifying Asian Australian communities, seeking to better understand the experience, status, contribution and recognition of these communities in Australia and their role in the development of Australia's relations with diverse Asian countries. The project supports a wide range of activities, including forums, conferences, and publications that aim to build the research capacity and profile of the project and position it to potentially influence government. The main output of the project so far has been a report by Nana Oishi entitled Workforce Diversity in Higher Education, the Experiences of Asian Academics in Australian Universities, which you can find on the Asia Institute's website. Sergi Danji's working paper on Indian Australians and Australian politics that forms the focal point for today's discussion and a corresponding overview piece in Melbourne Asia Review represent the second main output from this project. So the topic of today's discussion is one in which the Asia Institute has a very keen interest and I sincerely hope that we are able to hold further discussions on this and other related topics in the future. Back to you, Melissa. Thank you very much, Andrew. And as you can tell, this has been a topic that's been close to our hearts at the Asia Institute for a long time. Representation of Asian Australians in many areas from higher education to politics is crucial for us as a country, for a diverse nation to be able to represent our diversity in all of our institutions. Um, for a number of years, we've been clear that there are problems with the representation in the political realm. Um, and I think you know, excellent work has been done showing that that level of underrepresentation and pinpointing it as a problem. Uh, what's been fantastic about Sajit's work, which she's just going to tell you about, is she's really looked at what those barriers are at an individual level, at an institutional and systemic level. And I think that's the first step in overcoming those. So over to you, Dr. Sajid Dunji. 
Uh, you are on mute, Sir Jade. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Melissa, for that. Um, I'd like to express my thanks to Asia Institute for um, supporting my research and giving me an opportunity to speak and share my research perspectives today. Um, that is um, the, the underrepresentation of Asians in the Australian parliaments and the local councils that is interrogating the representation gap. Um, the 2016 census data shows that, you know, over 30% of the Australian resident population is born overseas. Um, the UK and the New Zealand continue to be still the common um, places of birth, but India, uh, China, India, and the Philippines together alone, they make up 20% of this overseas born population. There is also a sizable um, pool of talented young people, second, third, and fourth generation, um, Asians who are ambitious, who are driven, who are part of the changing generational dynamic in Australia. But do we see this sizable um, diaspora reflected or represented in the federal or state governments and in the local shires? These young tertiary educated um, majority of Asians who speak English more than their parents, they are keener to exercise their full rights of citizenship in the policymaking decisions that affect them to amplify their voices in the decisions um, through political representation. They want to be part of the parliament where these decisions are made, much more than just being in community activism and leadership roles. So what does Asian Australian um, political representation look like today? Um, my research was based on the 2019 federal elections, the 2019 New South Wales state election, the 2018 Victoria <coughs> state election, and their respective um, Shire um, elections in the same years. Um, these two states are home to the larger Asian diaspora. And my findings show that um, the representation of Asian candidates or Asian um, uh, participants is minimal at all levels of federal, state, and it's improving in the local council shires, which is the uh, political, it is the first level of political entree uh, for Asian candidates vying for elections in uh, becoming councillors. But compared to other traditional immigrant receiving um, nations, such as the US, the UK, um, Canada, and New Zealand, um, Australia is lag lagging behind in representation of Asians in the three tiers of governance. Even when these nations had smaller sized um, Asian diaspora, they were doing better than Australia. So the question I asked myself was, what factors explain the representation gap? And I narrow it down into two broad categories. Um, one is at the individual, individual and community level, and the second is the institutional level. Um, majority of the Asians uh, participating in the electoral processes are recent uh, party members. They have only joined the parties recently. Um, they're also finding it difficult to navigate the internal party mechanisms. It's a daunting experience, a time-consuming experience, particularly if you're also working full-time. Um, they also lack the social capital, uh, social networks with politicians or long-standing party members, and finding those indispensable political mentors that can be so useful to successful candidature. Um, at the community level, we have a different dynamic. Asian diasporas are heterogeneous. Um, they're residentially and geographically segregated. Whilst it, this is a positive indication of acculturation, as far as politics goes, it, it works negatively towards them because it's very difficult to bond ties to secure votes at uh, electoral votes. Um, and the last, um, factor that contributes to underrepresentation at the individual and community level is that they also have limited financial resources. Um, as we all know, the parties, apart from the um, photoshot party pamphlets and nominal funding, candidates have to balance their regular work 
plus you know go out campaigning or take leave from their jobs and dig into their own resources to lodge a competitive campaign you know so working and learning at the same time is kind of um, hard for them but these are not the only factors that explain um, why the um, there is underrepresentation or there's a representation gap in in you know uh, Asians in the three tiers of government. Um, one of the largest hurdles is the systemic one, which is the complex process of pre-selection guarded by political party um, gatekeepers, so to speak, who gets selected, where they're placed on the ballot paper, whether they're in a winnable, an unwinnable seat or in a marginal seat. Um, and invariably, Asians will find themselves placed in um, electorate seats that are being contested, but they don't really matter to the parties one way or the other. They're just filling a slot. But sometimes even those who are previously successful, they also find themselves um, slotted in the lower half of the ballot paper, such as uh, Senator Lisa Singh of Tasmania was. Um, for novices, it's the internal um, mechanisms uh, or the machinations, I can say, of the political parties that are probably the most difficult hurdle to grasp. Um, and, but let's not forget that majority of the candidates who are vying for positions, they have worked for uh, members of parliament in a voluntary uh, position and introduce them to community leaders and you know, being the go-between before they think of taking up um, uh, candidature themselves. And another um, hurdle is that of um, the negative media publicity, discrediting candidates um, through uh, publicity in the newspapers, on the radio or television. And the Asian candidates, they lack resources um, to fend off false allegations. Um, mind you, it happens to all candidates um, and handling negative uh, media publicity or fighting back needs requires deep pockets of resources, which most of these candidates don't have. But I do hasten to add that um, quite rightly, when candidates make um, statements that are clearly inappropriate or they display uh, public behavior that's unbecoming, they should be pointed out and they should be in the public glare. But then take the negative media campaigns against um, a candidate like Shireen Morris, um, a lawyer, um, University of Melbourne graduate, a lecturer, um, well known for her work uh, with the indigenous people. Um, she received a lot of negative attention that A, she was born in Fiji and not in Australia, that she was a Muslim, and overnight her posters were graffitied with uh, niqab um, to show that, you know, she was a Muslim. And that kind of negative publicity is hard for candidates to fight. Um, and it's particularly for newcomers, it can also be very, very daunting, almost frightening, having, you know, yourself in the public glare for something that's quite untrue. So overall, my findings show that there is a perception that the Asian diaspora is undervalued. Their um, value lies in contributing to the Australian economy. Um, and other than that, they are largely election fodder, uh, filling you know, slots where there are no other candidates available or as preference um, funnels, um, not really buying in electorates where the vote really counts for the parties, for the political parties. For the savvy, um, interconnected Asians, um, they know that Asians are visible in other countries, um, immigrant receiving nations. Um, they can see them in not only in parliaments, they can see them in public policy roles, in areas where things matter, in cabinets, even the youth are more engaged. Um, so the question that I then they ask, then I have to ask is why is there an underrepresentation? They have the numbers, the diasporas are there, the, there's a young, talented pool of candidates to select. Um, it's invariably at um, 
um, closer to the election period, we find politicians going and visiting um, communities at their halls, at their religious um, institutions, and you know, meet and greet and get to know the community, making promises. Um, and so the really candidates act as the go-between, but they're not selected for representation. Um, and that's where the question of you know, the value of the diaspora comes in. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the forthcoming elections and you know, to ask, has the Asian diaspora come of age? They have been here for a long time now, uh, not as long as many other nations, but even those nations, when they had their diasporas of similar size, they were doing better. Has the diaspora come of age? Will we see more Asian representation in the forthcoming elections? Will the parties perhaps read my report and address some of the hurdles, the systemic hurdles that I have outlined? Um, I hope you will join me in keeping an eye on these matters and um, I look forward to seeing whether there's an improvement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sajit. And I think that that's a great question to leave us with. When will the diaspora come of age? When will we see the sort of representation that we would expect? Um, now, you're already getting a lot of interest. So I see in Q&A, uh, we have a question from Osmond. I imagine that's Osmond Shaw. Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Someone who's worked so much in this area for a long time. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, turn to our panel to hear a little bit about their experience. Um, so I'm going to turn to, to Gladys Lu, to Koshalia Vagela, and to Daniel Nguyen. Um, I'll start off just with a nice simple one. Um, I want to hear a bit about your story. So can you tell me why did you go into politics? Um, and, you know, just a little bit on your political career so far. So starting with you, Gladys. All right, thank you, Melissa. Um, before I start, I just have to say that, uh, Sergi, your research has been fantastic. Um, listen to your report just now. Uh, actually, I've been writing down and I thought, tick, 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 tick. That's my experience, very mm. much so. Um, so back to you, uh, your question, Melissa. Uh, mm. I have been in the country 36 years. Mm. Uh, I came as an international student, uh, and I had uh, no family, no friends, no money, and very little English at the time. And definitely never at the time and never thought that I would get into politics. It was just so far, far away. But anyway, 18 years ago, so six, 18 years, knew nothing about politics. And um, then one day, a friend of mine asked me to join the Liberal Party. And my immediate response was, why? <laughs> um, <laughs> to me, that is something that me, really? Um, but she said, well, join in and there are many things that you can learn and being a person who is very curious and uh, about learning. And I thought, okay, yeah, I, I joined the party. And very, very quickly, uh, I felt that um, I had so much that I didn't know uh, that I really wanted to learn more and share what I have learned with other migrants. So that's how it all started. Um, and very quickly in 2005, I went to my first pre-selection in the party. Um, I didn't get the position I wanted. Like Sergit said, um, you don't get a winnable position. But I was happy to be an unwinnable uh, candidate. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to win, but I, I wanted the experience. So I was number four on the upper house state election ticket. And of course, I learned a lot. Uh, I campaigned so hard that as if I was going to win. And uh, people said that I was crazy. But anyway, I was a bit crazy. And after the election, I was offered a job from the opposition leader's office. Wow, it is something that I never thought that would happen. Um, you'll be lucky to get a job with a backbencher like me, but all of a sudden, the opposition leader. So anyway, so that's how it accelerated my involvement in politics. And obviously, the more you do, the more you learn. And um, I was working with the opposition leader, Ted Bailey, at the time, and we won the election in 2010. And I was working for him and uh, his successor, uh, Dr. Dennis Napdine. Uh, so all up, I was working as an advisor for seven years. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I came 
to study speech pathology. I also got myself into small businesses. And uh, so uh, I, I felt really, really good and that um, I was able to learn so much. So during the time um, in the Liberal Party, um, after the first attempt in 2006, unsuccessful, but I got a job. <laughs> and then 2010, I tried again. Uh, like Sergi said, I did not get a, a good position. Again, I was um, for upper house, uh, state upper house ticket. And then 2014, same thing. Okay. So um, I was thinking, what's wrong? What's going on? I mean, uh, I definitely um, know what I uh, I am doing, and uh, I I felt that I have shown people what I could do. Mm -hmm. um, in 2017, I went for another pre-selection in the party, mm -hmm. and uh, um, again, I did not get a good position. And at that time, I thought, okay, this is it. All right, oh. yeah, I'm out of it. <laughs> okay. um, but um, I didn't leave the party. I just um, scaled down my involvement. Um, and then opportunity came in 2018 pre-selection. Uh, this time is a federal seat. Never thought that I would run for a federal mm. seat and never thought I would run for a House of Rep seat mm. uh, position. But anyway, the opportunity was right in front of me. I have lived in and around this electorate for 30 years. So I thought I'll give it a go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got pre-selected. Um, at the time, it was very tough, very, very tough campaigning because um, maybe people were thinking that, well, look, we're not going to win the seat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, again, being me, um, I worked so hard. And as we all know, I just got in. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's the history. That's how I it got shows, to where I am. <laughs> it shows the tenacity that you need to have to get that far. So, so um, Koshalia, tell us about your story. Why did you go into politics? Um, with my stories, there are a few similarities with yeah. what Gladys has mentioned about um, um, what she went through. And, and I suppose uh, some of the things are uh, common when a new migrant comes to this country and, and tries to establish if, if he or she wants to do in politics. But um, there were quite a few differences in, in terms of my story with, the, with what I was uh, listening to Gladys' story. So um, I came to Australia in 1998 as an international student. Um, if somebody had told me even a few, few years ago that I would become an MP, I would have laughed um, because uh, by, by qualification um, and, and by my um, work experience and everything that I've done, I'm from a science background. So I'm a, a research scientist and I'm a medical scientist, which has got nothing to do with politics. I don't come, I don't come from a background where anyone has ever contested any election or, or taken part actively in, in politics to become an MP. Um, so prior to my um, election, which was in a 2018 state election, I had never contested any election, none whatsoever, uh, whether it was a council election or none. So that was my first experience. But in, in terms of my, my pathway to politics, it was very circumstantial. Um, it, it just started from the advocacy regarding the um, traders which were based in Little India and Daninong, um, the area where they were trading that was um, compulsorily acquired by the government to revitalize uh, that particular area. And I and other traders who were there at the time felt that um, we were treated unfairly. And I, I just took um, a stance. I had a lot of support from the traders and I just did the advocacy to fight for injustice for, for the traders. And that doing that for quite a few years um, gave me some opportunities to meet with the politicians um, over here in Australia and further down the track, it um, 
made me a little bit more aware of what the politics, I had no idea of how politics works over here. So it gave me a little bit more understanding about politics. Um, and I came here as a, as a student, uh, married, being a mom, Politics is the last thing on your mind when you come here and, and trying to establish a from scratch. Um, what, what you are worried is how are you going to make a living and, and other things that we new migrants think about, your job, uh, your, your child, their education and, and buying a house and, and those sort of things. So politics is, is it, it was never in, in, in radar of what my um, plan was when I, when I came to Australia. But this, this path that I took uh, for the advocacy for the traders actually um, taught me quite a few things. And one of them was that we don't have representation from Indian background in the parliament. So when there are issues which are pertaining to uh, uh, any ethnic communities, and in my case, it was to Indian community, I felt that if we wanted to go and speak to somebody, there wasn't a representation there. And I, I felt that, uh, I mean, we did speak to other MPs and, and, but we were not quite sure whether they would understand where we were coming from because the advocacy that we were doing for the traders, they were a predominantly Indian background um, traders uh, and South Asian. So uh, I, I did feel the need at, at that time uh, during the advocacy, uh, but again, there there was no plan. Okay. And then while while um, you know doing the advocacy and and activism for the traders, a meeting with the, with the MPs, a meeting with people from political backgrounds, and then I started engaging with the um, Indian community because I'm from India. That was the first point in in terms of the community engaging with communities, and slowly. Um, I got heavily involved with Indian and South Asian communities. And the more I got involved, I actually enjoyed uh, being with the community, knowing what their issues are. Um, and, and from there, I got the opportunity to work uh, as an advisor uh, in the then Multicultural Affairs Minister's office, which was one day a week, which gave me um, a lot of insight into how politics work, because until, until you are in those positions, uh, you, you are not quite sure because seeing other MPs, seeing other advisors, reading about it, uh, it it's not the same. You getting the first-hand experience yeah. working, working in, in those um, offices. So that actually gave me um, uh, a, a, a lot of insight and, and information. And so after working for uh, a year and a half as a multicultural advisor, um, then this opportunity came up, uh, which was for the upper house seat mm -hmm. for the Western metropolitan uh, region. And mm -hmm. it was a marginal seat. It wasn't mm -hmm. a seat which was um, minimal. It wasn't that no, nobody can win. Mm -hmm. So it was a marginal mm -hmm. seat, um, but I, worked very, very hard during the campaign, but I was very, very well known in the community though over the years, because if we put the combined time of me and my husband both involved in, in, in the advocacy and in the community, the combined years would be somewhere around 26, 27, 28 years. Yeah. Every day, every single day out and about being in the community. So I, I, I think, a lot of hard work, time, effort, energy, and money that I've put over yeah. these years slowly led me to the path of getting this opportunity, yeah. working as an advisor and getting the opportunity to contest the election because yeah. I come from a very small town, um, not yeah. from a metro city and, and okay. not knowing how it works. Fascinating. And it's very interesting to hear from both of your stories so far that, you know, you hadn't even considered politics as a career. You were you're busy working on your professional careers, etc. And it's sort of later on you came to it. Um, well, I, I'm going to turn down 
now to Daniel. I think you'll give us a good counterpoint because obviously, Daniel, you came at it earlier in your life. And interestingly, you um, you stood successfully as an independent um, outside a political party. And I'm interested in your story. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and land in which I am today. And also want to acknowledge um, elders of my community and also other cultural communities that are here with us today. And I see a few of them in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think for me, um, you know, my family history is one of, you know, my, both my parents um, came from Vietnam as refugees after the war. Um, you know, my brother and I sort of grew up sort of in public housing, went through sort of, I guess, that migrant journey of sort of, um, you know, being part of the community, you know, surviving, then, hope, then you know, being very lucky to thrive. Um, and, you know, really through sort of my parents' hard work um, and also a lot, a lot of luck um, in that. And so for me, in terms of looking at, Sort of my professional career. Um, my interest was looking at sort of how we can improve things in our society. And that's sort of what um, really drew me to politics and drew me to sort of looking at those systems. And, you know, fundamentally, I believe that, you know, all levels of government, whether they be local, state or federal, um, play a significant role within sort of dictating our lives, but then also really uplifting and mobilising people um, who sort of need that little bit of a hand up, particularly as they come into our country as well. If we're talking about some migrant communities. Um, and so that was my journey. And I, and I sort of looked at it and I sort of said, you know, I want to see what government's like. I want to be involved in policy decisions. I want to be um, someone that can sort of impact these changes. And, and I've done that a little bit professionally in various different ways. Um, and I sort of said, you know, why not give it a shot um, and see where I go? And I think for me, I looked at it. And again, the reason why sort of, you know, I chose particularly at the local level, you know, on one hand, there was definitely the structure issues. Like I had no chance at a state or sort of federal um, state. So the, the barriers of entry were just too great there. But then on the other hand was, you know, I grew up in Richmond. I grew up in the public housing there. Um, you know, it's a community which has a large Vietnamese population. Um, and I thought looking at it, you know, unfortunately there are just too many policies that I didn't feel really addressed um, some of the needs in that area. So, you know, on top of sort of the cultural issues of being someone from that community, you know, I looked at it from, you know, being someone who's a bit younger, representing sort of a youth perspective, someone who had that lived experience um, within the public housing, you know, which made up, you know, 12% um, of that area and in some suburbs, 20%. And so for me, it was really looking at, you know, is there a way that, you know, I can be part of that change, I can be part of that influence and really playing a bit of a role. And that's sort of what ultimately led me to my decision to run and, you know, very fortunate and very lucky um, to have been elected and spent some time in that domain. Can you tell us a little more about the, the process as the independent of, of actually getting yourself elected? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for me, again, like I, probably like the other two, like whilst I had an interest in politics and it's something I followed, you know, as a young age, I knew the systems perhaps from like a, a civics perspective, but I had no clue in terms of anything to do with how to run, how to campaign and all the sort of nitty gritty that that came with that. And the reality is I'd never met um, a politician at any level um, prior to me running. So, you know, not only did I sort of not have that lived experience and didn't really have anyone to lean on through there as well. So to be fair, it was just a lot of, you know, jumping on the internet, jumping on YouTube, you know, speaking to a few different people. And, you know, I was fortunate someone did reach out to me from the Vietnamese community and gave me a few tips um, with that. But, you know, again, it was just, it's an interesting experience running as an independent because I think, um, you know, again, there are pros and cons. And I think a big part of, for me of choosing to run as an independent, particularly at a local level, was actually being a bit more, um, hands-free and being able to dictate sort of my own decision-making, not being held to party lines, not having that, so having a bit of freedom in that sense. So, you know, it was an important decision at that point. So less resources, but more freedom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and it's the barriers, to be honest. Again, I had no chance in any party. Yeah. 100% not. Okay, well, let's talk a bit more about those barriers. So Sajid, in her research, um, distinguishes between the, the individual level ones. So, you know, lack of mentors. You haven't met someone from a, from a party before. You haven't, you know, got the networks. You haven't got the financial resources. Um, and then at the, at the institutional level, um, uh, you've got issues like um, internal party mechanisms, the pre-selection process, um, factional competition. So I'm interested, I'll go back to the panel just to find out, you know, which out of those sort of, you know, does that ring true to you to start with? You know, have you seen those sort of barriers? Are there any other barriers? And which were the sort of barriers that, you know, you had to fight hardest to overcome? So I'll go back to Gladys. 
Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, definitely, those barriers um, are very real. Um, but I would also add one more there, and that is, um, as a migrant, like um, Kasheria said, um, you put a lot of focus on um, building a, a career, a family, you have to look after your income. Um, you don't really pay too much attention to politics. And, um, and definitely, I didn't grow up uh, in a family who talked about politics. My parents were actually very poor farmers from mainland China, and they went to Hong Kong, and that's where I was born. Um, and um, uh, very poor, we, I grew up in the um, um, housing commission as well. Uh, and I had to rely on scholarship uh, for my study the whole, the, all, all through my life, coming here on scholarship too. So um, you never hear about politics, you never really um, know anything uh, about politics. So I think that disadvantage a lot of migrants, especially um, migrant uh, first generation and their children. And of course, if you get to the third or fourth generation, maybe you are just living um, like one of the locals um, who have been here for generations. So that may be different. But as, as uh, for migrants and the first generation, definitely politics is not something that uh, parents would encourage you to do. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that also uh, goes with uh, community involvement as well. Um, and being a politician, um, basically you really, really have to have the heart to serve the community. You, if you don't want to serve the community, don't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for migrants, um, um, people come here, they have to, as I said, with all the challenges, you just have to build up your sense of belongings and the, the urge to serve. So that is not something that it will come straight away. So it takes time. Um, and of course, being uh, in the party, again, that is something that you have to learn, learn in a very fast way too. Um, I feel that uh, as a, a, a uh, a party member with an ethnic background, a lot of people from the party would want you to uh, bring in what you can from your ethnic background, from your, love for me is the Chinese group. So they want me to introduce the Chinese uh, community leaders and what they would like and, and all sort of um, knowledge about this particular community. And of course I could do the job and I, I can do it very well too. Um, but what it means is the time um, that you have, if you focus uh, on doing that, that means you have less time to do others. Yeah. Now, that can be easily seen as you are only good at that. And, right. and it, it will give people the, the wrong impression that you're you not in this really. sort of this niche yeah. or this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So, mm. Kashata. Um. Again, I have to agree with uh, Gladys has mentioned uh, uh, similar sort of views. Um, uh, but what I would also like to add how I um, overcame some of the barriers was um, after I, I became uh, an, an advisor in the minister's office, um, I was the uh, first Indian woman to hold that position um, to, to become an advisor. And uh, prior to me, there were many other um, Indians living in Victoria who had uh, tried um, to become an MP or, or be successful in, in, in political sphere. So what I did is I saw what they were doing that did not work because that is what I was not going to do. Um, because we have had many male advisors and we have had many other people who tried contesting. So some of the things which I noticed, um, I thought, okay, so the first thing is, is that is the way I'm going to uh, overcome some of the challenges that we face. Um, and and uh, the example would be, which uh, Gladys has already mentioned, your intent has to be right. Your intent has to be to serve the community. Um, you are doing things because you want to become an MP is probably one way of doing things. While for me, I just wanted to serve the community and that led 
me to become an MP. So that's the total opposite of what everyone else was trying so far from Indian community. And, and I saw that this is the checklist of the people. They say, okay, I've done that to become an MP. I've done that to become successful. I'm not going to do any of those things. Okay. So building up your constituency, showing yourself as someone who can represent your community. Yeah. Yes. So how do you overcome? So people will only take you seriously if they feel that you are there for the community, not for yourself, not for self-promotion. And, and I think once we, um, once we are seen as that, then people will, will sort of take you seriously. And, and barriers are, are, are many barriers. Um, ladies has already um, touched base on that. And, and Sujit has mentioned very clearly and nicely in, in the report that uh, uh, she has uh, generated, which, which actually talks about all, all the barriers that we face. But uh, me particularly, and of course, Gladys as well, uh, coming uh, from ethnic background, uh, a person of color, a woman and a mom, again, has its own um, uh, problems. And, and as far as the, the party is, is, is um, concerned, um, of course, I'm, I'm part of, um, you know, I'm a Labour Party member. Uh, there are factions we all know. Um, uh, it's more structured in, in Labour Party than in Liberal Party. It's, it's like families. You know how in our own families we have got uh, uncles and aunts and we get together um, and, and then there are issues. So they, they are there. In, in life also, we deal with them. When they are get together, there are some aunties and, and, and Christmas dinners. Maybe we try to avoid certain things or certain people or do or don't do certain things. I, I think it, it's just, it, it is like that. Uh, you just, can't escape. You it's can't just something escape. you have to manage in that sense. You, you, yeah. you have to work um, uh, uh, through. But once, once you understand how the faction works, mm -hmm. it sort of makes it easier. But it is very, very daunting to understand how the faction work. And again, after that also, um, um, Dr. Sujit has also already mentioned about um, um, Lisa Singh's case in the report. Yeah. There is no guarantee um, that doesn't matter how you have ticked all the boxes to be become, uh, you know, a, a, a candidate to become an MP, there's still no guarantee that that will happen because factional play will will be yeah. there, whether you like so it or not. You're always having to manage that as well as the external, you have to manage the internal support. Yeah. Okay. Well, Daniel, your view on barriers. Yeah, I probably wanted to mention two points I just wanted to highlight mm -hmm. in terms of the report and what it found. I think firstly, in terms of um, you know, working to build individual capacities and empowerments within communities. I think that's obviously something you have to do and is, is part of the mix, but I don't like to focus on that. And, and the reason I don't like to focus on that is I'm sorry, but if you're telling me that, you know, in my community, at me community, there's not one person out there of my generation that can currently sit in parliament, that's ridiculous. Like in terms of the skills that they're there, there are people that are qualified, there are people that have that ability. So I don't like focusing on that because the other thing I probably was lucky enough to be able to be exposed to, because I had a little bit of this myself, is that having never spoken or met anyone, at, you know, who was in any level of politics, I definitely had this belief that there was some, you know, mythical creature of great intellect and, you know, amazing skills. And, and the unfortunate reality is it's not. And that saddens me to say that, because again, for me, I think people in those positions are about sort of improving communities. And so I think I want to sort of highlight that Probably, you know, the structural ones, I think, is a more of interest in the sense of that, obviously, there's the political structures that create barriers. But I think, you know, another level of structure and another level of barrier, which I wanted to particular highlight in this one, is that there are also the societal barriers in terms of just, you know, the racist infrastructure and structures that we have. It's not just at politics. And so whilst it might permeate through politics, you know, there are cultural issues, there are things that underpin our society, which make it hard. And I'll, I'll give you an example is that in a sense of we don't see leadership anywhere, you know, people sort of, you know, cultural backgrounds. And therefore that makes it hard. And, you know, I think it makes it difficult for the voters to start to see that and to realise that, you know, we don't see, you know, that leadership permeate through. And it's even interesting within my own community, like, you know, the number of doubters I had within the Vietnamese community about my ability to do a job based on the fact that I think, again, you know, they haven't seen it in the past is also difficult. So I think, you know, whilst you have to unpack, you know, the political structures, there are some really, you know, big picture um, structural issues that exist within our society that unless we unpack that work as well, is that we won't get, 
you know, that representation throughout um, our decision makers. Yeah, and, and you know, people have we we know from research people have stereotypes in their mind. When you ask people to think of a leader, they will go for you know whatever the dominant group looks like. So in our society, that's probably like a white male. And then the further you are from that group, the more you have to prove your leadership. Um, but I think it's so, further than that. I think it's it's like obviously there's the appearance and stuff. But then when we look at some of the cultures, and I can't speak for all sort of Asian mm-hmm. cultures, and I wouldn't want to, but you know, particularly in sort of Vietnamese communities, is that. You know, we have a different approach in terms of the way that we work. You know, perhaps we're not as adversarial. We're taught culturally that perhaps yeah. sticking your head out isn't the best way. And some of these things don't align with what, sort of, you know, Western societies believe as leaders. And unless Definitely. we unpack that, yeah. you know. Yeah, so the model of leadership might be, say, more collaborative than, you know, has been traditional. Makes sense. Okay. Now, look, and thank you all for, for sharing some of those views on the barriers and how you've personally overcome them. We're getting some great questions in. And so I want to just make sure we have a chance to, to respond to those. So the first one is for you, Sajid. Um, so Osman Chiu, who's, who's done um, amazing work in this area, has a reaction to the research um, looking at a couple of things. Firstly, whether you saw pre-selection and factional processes differing between states you know, in the way they operate and whether that had any impact. And then your view on why Australia is doing worse than comparable countries like New Zealand, Canada, UK and the US. So your response to that, Sajid. And you are still on mute, just to warn you. Um, Thank you for your question, Osmond. Yes, indeed, there are differences between pre-selection between different Commonwealth states um, that is uh, dealt with in the report, not in a great um, uh, uh, space, but I am quite aware of it. And I was conscious when I was writing the report. Um, And then, of course, there's Liberal and uh, Labour as well. There's that big difference between states again. Um, And your other question was why... um, Sorry, I'm just trying to get your question. Why comparable countries are doing better? Um, I think they have embraced uh, diversity better than we have in the political space. Um, We're only just at the um, starting stages acknowledging that there is an underrepresentation gap. Um, We haven't quite asked the serious questions why. Um, as I said, there is enough talent, and Daniel has said that as well. There's the potential of a talent, there's the potential of different perspectives, educated, um, tertiary educated in Australia as well, who are, you know, very keen to participate in po- politics. Um, so we, we need po- um, the political parties to look into ways and means of doing this. Canada and the US have their own... Um, uh, um, pathways or pipelines, as I would say, into that can lead into um, political candidature. Um, New Zealand has been much more uh, open to welcoming people from diverse backgrounds. Um, but uh, I think Australia has some work to do. Thank you, Sajid. Okay, well, our next question will be to our panellists. So it's from Jay Song, one of the uh, wonderful researchers at the Asia Institute. And um, She's reflecting on on your comments, Gladys, that ethnicity can be both a barrier and a social capital at the same time. Um, So she's interested in how you select your own co-ethnic groups to work with or to keep distance from, to stand out and be selected by your partner as potentially an ethnic candidate. So reactions, I'll start with you, Gladys. Yep, sure. Um, Thank you for the question, Jay. Um, Obviously, uh, I have all, well, as I said, I run um, quite a number of times for state uh, and um, this time for federal. Uh, The the electorates that I've been, I've run, um, they are all familiar electorates, like I would not go to uh, Bendigo or Ballarat or, uh, or, or Mildura, somewhere that I have no idea. So local knowledge is very important. Your um, ethnic group is uh, background is also important. For me, my electorate has got more people born overseas than locally born. And um, the, the, the biggest ethnic group is being Chinese. So um, obviously I use it um, as an advantage of maximizing my service to the community because um, being able to speak 
fluently in English, Mandarin and Cantonese, uh, that, that obviously helped me to do my job. Um, and coming uh, to the country as a migrant, I do um, have a lot in common with a lot of people uh, in my electorate. So you really have to make the most of um, your life experience, your what you can um, use from your life experience in politics and represent the people. So the more common things, say for example, I used to work as a speech pathologist for uh, autistic children. So when I go to facilities um, uh, helping people with um, intellectual disability or um, autism, um, obviously, obviously I would bring out my experience mm -hmm. um, from the past to, uh, to help them. So, um, you just have to use what uh, what you have, um, but at the same time, it is a barrier because some other people will see you and frame you as uh, only good for that. For my Facebook posts, um, every day I put up um, on average two posts, and uh, um, about one hundred posts. If I put one post with Chinese faces there, people will attack me for you only work for Chinese people. And that is quite unfair because uh, I do work for everyone in my electorate and I don't really um, need people to, to highlight the, the fact that I serve Chinese community. Of course I do because they are also part of the community, part of the electorate. So yes, these are the things that you just have to be careful, but at the same time, um, you can't really win every single person's um, uh, view so you just have to put up with it um, and do your best but at the end of the day if you know what you're doing then just do it because mm. I know I do know that I want to serve everyone in my electorate mm. okay and, and Koshali would like to come in on that um look again uh, it's it's similar to what uh, Gladys has mentioned um, coming from Indian background um, when people find out that one of their person is contesting election or has become an MP, um, they, they are proud of you because, uh, I mean, in my case, I'm the first Indian MP in Victoria. And, and in Gladys's case, it, it's the same thing with the um, uh, Chinese community. So uh, people from our community, of course, they do want to connect. Um, but I, I have a, a, a feeling, and that's what I've gone through, that initially when you're doing, whether it's uh, the advocacy work you're doing or, or community work, of course, you're going to start from somewhere. Uh, because I wasn't born here, where I went to school and went to college, and I did um, probably, say, Labour Party's work right from very young age. So what I started was what you know, I was confronted with, which was the issue with the traders with the Indian community. As a result, I automatically was um, engaging with the Indian community. But after becoming an MP, I've got uh, around 550,000 constituents uh, living in my elected. I'm the MP for all of them. I'm not just MP for Indians only. And also all the work that we are doing for 550,000 um, um, constituents that we have, there are Indians as, uh, there as well. So if some good policies for schools, they are not just for non-Indians only, they are also applicable to Indians as well. Um, but I, I also have a good or big following of, of uh, Indian people, um, maybe because there is no other MP. I'm the only MP from Indian background. Um, and people do come to me because at times they're, you know, with other people, they have many other MPs in, in all different electorates. For Indians, there is only one MP. So of course they are going to come to me. So that again becomes your strength, um, working with them. And so at, at times, you know, you, you feel uh, when you come from Indian background, there are certain stereotypes, people will have certain, um, you know, preconceived notions about you just because I'm from India, I'll be such and such, such and such, um, just because I come from India. But that, that's not true. Okay. Um, so so you, you do face those, which of course comes with the ethnicity. Mm -hmm. It sounds a difficult balancing act in that it sense. Is. Daniel, do you want to come in? 
Oh, the only thing I'd probably add is, to be honest, I think anyone here who works within sort of cultural communities is that the politics within our individual communities, I guarantee you, is much more difficult to navigate than the electoral politics any day. I'll yeah. just switch it over any day. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, well, I've got uh, one, I, I think I've got time for one more audience question, and I'm going to end up with one question of my own. So, um, Onisha has asked uh, the panellists, quick answer, how do you think your experience in politics so far has changed you as a person? I'll, I'll start first. Um, I become a different person, basically. Before politics, um, I was uh, a mother of two children. I dedicated 100% of my time to them um, and even a stay-at-home mom for a long time until my son was 18. Uh, I only worked part-time um, because I wanted to still get in touch with uh, the real world out there. So um, you look at things um, very, very small and you can get uh, annoyed and irritated for, by very small things. Whereas now, I'm a different person. Um, <laughs> well, I look at policies that uh, it's important to the country. Yeah. I look at my electorate with 170,000 people living here. Yeah. Um, I care about other people. I don't really care that much about myself anymore. People can, uh, people like me, I'm very happy. If people don't like me, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that for that. That happens you. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. So you can't, you can't make everyone like you because people have different views. And especially if they are rusted on uh, another party, that's fine. It, it's quite okay. So I found that I am very much more accommodating. And the other thing is, I really want to use this opportunity uh, or my status to help other people, in particular migrants, to understand this country, to embrace this country, to make sure um, you know we have opportunities in this country. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I want those who have been here for generations to, to understand and embrace um, newer comers yeah. um, to acknowledge their contributions as well. So all by understanding each other, this country, Australia, will be even better. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, look, for me, um, there are certain values um, in, in my life, whether I am in politics, was in politics, not in politics, until I take my last breath, some of the values will have been with me and will always stay. So um, say for example, for Labour Party, uh, uh, you know, compassion, um, justice, equality, fairness, all those things um, have been very important for, for me um, from very early on, um, just because the upbringing that I've had, because those values were very important to my parents as well. So they, are, they were important then, they are very important now. Those values have not changed. I'm an MP today, I might not be MP tomorrow, but those values will uh, always uh, stay. Um, just because I'll become an MP, my, my values are not going to change. Yes, um, I agree with what uh, Gladys is saying. Mm. Um, you meet with so many different people with so many different issues and your issues become really nothing when you when you hear people approaching you with their issues. So um, you also get a different perspective on life. But one thing that has changed in me um, since I've become a politician is I've become very thick-skinned because Politics is a very ruthless game. You are under scrutiny 24-7. Um, and you literally have to be very, very, very tough to ignore social media in the community. Um, mm -hmm. I, I used to be very a very sensitive person because I, I wasn't a politician. So when somebody says something to me, it, it is to upset. Now people can say whatever they want to, they can write. So that has actually changed that one yeah. thing has made a big change on, on me. I don't worry about little things. I don't actually worry too much about what people think about me because I know all what I'm doing is in my role, what is involved to serve the community and that's what I'm doing. Thank you. 
Yeah. And interesting, Matt, that you have to develop that thick skin. I, I think you've responded to some of the questions we've seen coming through in the chat about how do you deal with negative media coverage. I think also um, one, one of uh, our comments was about, you know, about power and uh, that is that what gets you into politics? And I, I think what I'm hearing from both of you so far is, and sorry, from all of you so far, is that it's about service, about serving the community. Um, so, Daniel, would you like to, to finish up? Yeah, I think um, from my perspective, like I am like eternally grateful for the time that I spent on council and as mayor, it's like one of the best experiences I've had in my life. But I think for me leaving sort of that arena, like I think it sort of opened up my eyes a little bit in terms of like the frustrations that I see. Like yeah. I look at the systems that are set up now across our sort of government decision-making and I just don't think there is any way with the current you know power structures we have in place is that those that need it most will be prioritised. And as unfortunate as that sounds, is in you know it's pretty consistent throughout our history of you know um, electoral politics for the last hundred odd years. And I think for me, that's the bit that I sort of leave with you know angst about. And yeah. you know, it's a tough you know pill to swallow to leave and not understand you know the ways to do that. But you know I hope the next generation, those that follow me after, absolutely are better prepared and have that you know those skills to un unpack that. Yeah, and and with that, I'd like to finish just with a sentence from each of you, if I can, from the panelists. What change do you think would make the most difference to um, greater representation of Asian Australians? So if you, if you were saying, Daniel, what, what, do, what change do you want to see? In a sentence, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, I'd unpack the way that um, our, the pre-selection processes work for the major parties um, at the beginning and, and look to the American models and look to a bigger primary field, look to, um, you know, unpacking the sort of factional um, issues that do exist as yeah. a start. Thank you. Kosh Ali. Um, it, it's hard to put because it, it, the, the question that you are asking is, is the actual answer probably Sujit was seeking through this report, you know, because if that changes, then everything will be changed and we yeah. might not be having this webinar. But, uh, and, and uh, Sujit has put it um, um, nicely because it's, it, it's a, a double pronged approach. And that again comes um, from, from the systemic issues that uh, Sujit has mentioned. But, um, the community needs to understand that we need to support capable people who can serve the community with right intent. Uh, because if if they say they want to give, uh, say, a winnable ticket to one person, and there are ten people in in the room, all those ten people will raise their hands. Uh, mm -hmm. A situation has to come, and all ten of them should be pointing at one capable pe person and say, "That is the person who will represent okay. us." That is, uh, I think, we need to change. Interesting. Okay, and Gladys. Um, the message to those who um, would like to be a politician is um, and make sure you uh, equip yourself um, with knowledge and um, also know that you do the job to serve people rather than the grabbing power. There is no power in this. Um, it's it's if, if when you have, even when you have power, it's the power to serve. So uh, you have to be very clear on that. And um, the, the message is make sure, um, uh, make sure you know that it will get easier because after Kashelia, myself and uh, we've got Sir Daniel from the, um, the council level. Uh, people, especially um, Kashalia and myself being the first and for me being under the, the spotlight all the time, it was tough, but I can tell you it's all worth it. And I'm sure um, people coming behind me, it won't be as tough because hopefully media will lose interest in <laughs> in people coming from an ethnic exactly. background. Because I prove to people, I want to prove to people that yeah. I am, if not as good, if not better, I'm as good. So yeah. I am here to do the job. Thank you. And thank you for such a positive note to end on. Um, we've been trying today, I think, to have that mix of understanding that there is a genuine problem of underrepresentation and that there are serious um, individual and systemic barriers that need to be overcome. 
Um, but at the same time, some people have managed to overcome them. And learning from them, I hope, is part of what helps us get to that um, diaspora coming of age where we have the representation that we should have for the health of our politics and our society. So if I can thank all of you for, for joining us today, I'd particularly like to thank Sajid for sharing her research and to our wonderful panellists, to Gladys, to Kashalia and to Daniel for joining us today. Thank you for coming to this Asia Institute webinar. We have another one coming up in April and we'll be advertising as usual in all the social media channels. Thank you again.